<laughs> My name is Willa. I work as an event coordinator at the University Bookstore. Our bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in Washington State. And I want to thank you all for being here and for the authors being here tonight for supporting your local and independent bookstores like ours. In just a moment, I would be happy to introduce everyone we have on stage tonight, but first some housekeeping. Please remain seated after the event is over so that the authors can take their seats for the signing. There will be further instructions after the discussion. I'll pop up here again and uh, give you some instructions how we would like the line to go. Tam uh, Tamara is signing up to four books and will be personalizing one, but she just told me that that one is one per person. So if you're getting it personalized for someone else, she will still personalize that. Um, if you brought more than four books or purchased more than four books to be signed, um, we ask you to wait until after everybody else has gotten their books signed. Uh, Rachel and Lish will also be signing. Yay. Okay. <laughs> First, I have the pleasure to introduce one of my personal favorite authors, Tamara Pierce. As you probably know... <laughs> As you probably know, she is a prolific and talented writer of fantasy. She's a New York Times bestseller. In 2013, she won the Margaret A. Edwards Award from the American Library Association, award given to one writer and a particular body of work for significant and lasting contribution to young literature. Though she's not done writing, so her, work, her body of work is expanding. She's an alumna of the University of Pennsylvania, and while there, she wrote her first quartet, The Song of the Lioness. <laughs> the first in that series, Alana, the First Adventure, was published in 1983. She joins us this evening to talk about her latest release, Tempests and Slaughter. <laughs> Joining her in conversation is Rachel Hartman. Rachel Hartman is best known. She is best known for her books in the Serafina duology. Serafina won the 2013 William C. Morris Award for Best Young Adult Book published in the US. Tonight, she is here with her latest, Tess of the Road. Our event... Our event tonight is moderated by Lish McBride. Lish is the author of Hold Me Closer, Necromancer, which won a um, 2011 Washington State Book Award and the William C. Morris Young Adult Debut Award. Her most recent novel is Pyromantic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Tamara Pierce, Rachel Hartman, and Lish McBride. I'm very pleased that you guys are already yelling. This is, this is my crowd. <laughs> I enjoy enthusiasm. Um, so I have questions, thankfully, for you guys. They also were questions that were rained upon while walking up here. So um, some of them, as you can see, are quite blurry. I'm going to pretend like I can read them anyway, and we'll see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> this first question is for both of you. You both have built very complex, um, rich worlds. You had lots of characters to choose from. You know, why did you go back to Numair? Why tests? Like what, out of all the characters you've gone, like what made you go back to them? I'm polite, she's politely declining to me. I, I, okay, okay. First of all, thank you all for coming out. You are so enthusiastic and that is really heartening and inspiring. Um, I wrote about Tess, uh, who happens to be one of Serafina's younger half sisters. So if you recall, uh, if you read Serafina, this probably isn't too spoilery because it's, it's pretty well known. She's half human and half dragon. Her sisters are entirely human. Um, and I was really struck by the idea. I mean, I have, I have sisters of my own and I know from personal experience that nobody in the world sees your flaws as keenly as a sister and loves you 
ferociously in spite of it. And so that's a dynamic that has always really interested me. But I thought, what if, what if you were one of the younger sisters of someone who had literally just saved the world? Uh, would you feel kind of like a loser, you know? <laughs> and so that was, I think, my first impetus for, for, for starting with Tess. Um, but yeah, in a big world, there's always so many characters. And, and so I have a lot of other stories planned, but I write so slowly, I just, I don't even know when we'll get to them. I'm sort of in the same bucket, actually. But as far as Aram is concerned, um, I figured it would behoove me to come up with a guy character. <laughs> Lead character. There are plenty of guys in all my books, but I was getting really tired of being asked, when are you going to write about a boy? Because apparently those other guys didn't count. <sighs> Living in otherwise. And um, I'd always wondered, and other people wondered, what was it like to be Numair, or his original name, Aram, uh, studying in Karthak, um, and being friends with Ozorn and Varese before everything went so drastically south. So I figured for a shot at a guy, main character, like the others weren't, <laughs> that I would go with him. It would give me a new setting, uh, Karthak and particularly the university and the school for mages. It would give me an opportunity to show people who had grown into power and the changes that came to them on the way. Um, and it would show a far less formidable new mayor, like when he was a major screw up, <laughs> which he was, because not only was he a kid, but he and pretty much everybody else around him had no idea of what he would become. All they knew was that the teachers back home had taught him all they can, and so he had to go somewhere else. So like a lot of my gifted friends, um, they entered college when most of their fellows were in middle school. And so Aram is outpacing his present classes and needs to be have his program adjusted before he drowns his classmates. Um, it, it was a challenge because, let's face it, in some ways guys are different from girls. That Wait, what? Oh. <laughs> what? I, I have one of my own, and, uh, and uh, he was not helpful. <laughs> I had to go to my writing partner, Bruce Koval. Um, yeah, Jeremy Thatcher, Dragon Hatcher. My teacher is an alien. I left my sneakers in Dimension X. Kiprioth, the trickster. That's Bruce. He was amused. Actually, he laughed because I needed very specific information about guys because my husband claimed it was a long time ago, and he'd forgotten. <laughs> so I, I cast myself up upon Bruce's skinny shoulder and then said, Thee, I need help. And he said, with what? And I told him. That's when the laughter began. <laughs> it did not end until after I had read those segments to him aloud with the information he had given me about boys maturing. <laughs> it, it is hard to quite see him as being so impressive now that you've seen him go through the horrible awkwardness that is puberty, and I found that very enriching. Um, uh, which kind of leads to my next question. Both of your characters have been side characters, like they kind of started off in the wings. Um, I mean, yours obviously spent much more time um, on page than tested, but 
When you went back in, how was it to see um, other characters you'd already done from different perspectives? I mean, like Serafina, we get a very different perspective of Serafina from before we were inside and we saw all the emotion and everything. And then from Tessa's point of view, she's quite rude, <laughs> which I liked, but um, it's a very different perspective because I was seeing it through Tess. And the same thing with um, um, Ozorn and them seeing them this time through Numair. Like, how was it to go back in and see your characters shifted to a different perspective? Well, for me, it was, it was the most fun part of the book to write, actually. Um, again, it goes back to that sister thing. Full disclosure, I have two sisters, and they're both younger. And so I know that if you're just going to go literally, in our family, I'm the Serafina. Although I haven't saved the world yet, I'm still, you know, I'm working up to it. Um, but anyway, uh, it, I think... So writing Serafina from Tessa's perspective, I felt like I was having kind of a double vision in a sense that I was seeing myself uh, through my younger sister's eyes at that age. And, um, and I, I know how they saw me. They, they made that pretty clear. And I know how I was too. Like Serafina, like she doesn't want Tess in her room. She is trying to read. Oh my God, just leave me alone. I think the book alone. interruption parts we all right. felt. So it's kind of like, I understand. <laughs> Yes, yes, it was very, you know. And at the same time, Tess just has no hesitation to call her out on just everything. And if you've read Serafina already, then you know that in some degrees Tess is wrong and Tess is being uncharitable and even, you know, just willfully misunderstanding things. Um, but that for me is one of the really interesting things just about writing characters in general is, is that it's, challenging just communicating with people, you know? Here I am, <laughs> sort of stammering through my speaking. Talking is not easy. Communicating with people and, and really getting your point across and understanding each other is not easy. And the, the words that you say go into somebody else's ears and through this, this prism of self that they have all set up and then they hear it, comes out some kind of rainbow on the other side that is not exactly what you put into their head, right? And so, um, you know, having, being able to show that from the other angle, let, show Tess misunderstanding, show Tess, it, it kind of let me, let me um, really explore uh, and illustrate what Tess's lens was that, with which she was looking at the world, that she, she um, you see how she has warped Serafina through her lens, that Serafina is criticizing her, Serafina is mean, Serafina is this and that, thinks she's so perfect, then you realize she's looking at the rest of the world with that same lens, and so it was a great kind of way to to illustrate her inner life as well. Um, I had a couple of aims in mind. Partly it was the idea that, yeah, he's great now, although he has his flaws. Uh, can't cook for beans because he forgets. Actually, he forgets a lot of things. Uh, like staying on the back of his horse. <laughs> but he is very formidable, and he can reach across half a world to help a, a very upset tree. Um, but people aren't born that way. Great people are not born great, and that goes for Ozorn. And even Varese, who has risen to a height her family never expected of her, rose to a greater height. They weren't born that way. They got there somehow, and that's what I wanted to get at, was that once upon a time, these were school kids with tests and teachers and bullies and homework and extracurricular activities. And how did they become what they became? And I've gotten a lot of questions along those lines. What was Ozorn like? Um, what made Ozorn what he became? What made Aram new mayor? Um, how was it? Because usually before, what I said about what happened was, well, he had to leave Karthak quickly. So this was a chance to say, you can do it. You may feel flubsy and human and clumsy like I do every day. Uh, and with reason, but you build, 
and you create, and you stumble, and you fall, and you make really bad mistakes um, without thinking about it because you're kids, and kids don't think about it. They just do and end up trying to explain where the water came from. <laughs> um, and that's part of growing up, and that's really what I wanted to get up is you really do have to start somewhere. And somewhere is never the most comfortable place to be. Um, <clears throat> my next question is for you, Tammy. I was talking to some other writers this weekend about um, kind of how, how long you've been writing and how, when I, was, when I first started reading, eh? it, sorry. <laughs> there is no way for me eh? to ask this question without making you sound like you're, you're somehow infirm, which you're most certainly not. But, Nonsense. <laughs> I'm going to get you a cane. You can start whacking people as you go I through. I left my cane in the waiting room. <laughs> um, but this, this business can be quite difficult, and the fact that you were basically at the forefront of young adult fantasy. Like, we were trying to think of people that had been there, and not only just been there, but also sustained a career and managed to create new and interesting takes on fantasy with the series. Like, what? We're all older and dirt, you know. <laughs> Herman, Oval, you name them, we're old. How have you kept it enjoyable in a business that can be quite rough? How do you keep it enjoyable? <laughs> or at least keep creating without openly weeping on the stage. Oh my, oh dear. Ah, yeah, it's enjoyable. Is this a hard drinking kind of question? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've given up alcohol. <laughs> Momentarily. Um, I keep looking for, I can't speak for anybody else, but I can't, I keep looking for new aspects and new ideas, new things I want to say. I try not to be preachy or overtly political, but the fact is that pretty much everything I do and write is dealing with things of our real world that I feel the screaming need to talk about, but know that if I start screaming, I'll end up somewhere nice and soft <laughs> with, with blurry drinks. And I'd as soon not do that because I'm one of those people who gets mad at the flash of lightning and stays mad a lot longer. Um, and I know there are people out there like me, idealists, who want to know. They, want, they don't want to be fogged off with excuses or outright lies. So I talk about the things that bother me, and that gives me certainly plenty of material. I started with how girls were viewed, the, everything beginning with can't, they can't. And then I just moved outward to the things that I felt needed addressing and needed introduction to people. There was a time when children were supposed to be protected, and I knew that was nonsense. I knew that kids were into anything, and they wanted to know things and they didn't want to be protected. And so I started addressing the things that were out there that would be very disagreeable surprises if the kids were forced to come up to them cold, say, around college. Um, give, give us a chance to have a look at an issue and think about it and put it aside for a while and then come back to it. Let us have a chance to talk about this new idea with our friends and our families. Um, let us have a chance to see what's ahead of us so we can start planning. And I haven't lost that idea. Uh, my audience has grown, but in the wake of the audience that has gotten older has come a young audience and new issues, and new ideas, and new approaches 
that I go, well, let's look at this. Let's talk about this. Let's see where we can introduce ourselves to it and look at it from different angles. So that's pretty much, I'm a screaming idealist, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, I've been this way for a long time. I've taken medication, but it hasn't done any good. <laughs> Um, and I keep reading, and I follow my obsessions, and that I get new ideas. I hit blind spots sometimes. Um, tension at home and tension in the hospital um, leads to Tammy not writing, but I get back to it because there's so much I've yet to say, and the worlds just keep growing. Yeah. One, I do think it's an important topic that you brought up with, um, you, I've been asked a lot, like with teens and reading and things, you know, they want you to, to keep that safe little bubble of uh -huh. that thing, but yeah, which is, it's laughable. And so, well, now you're also speaking to, to one certain kind of kid who maybe luckily has not encountered anything terrible yet. And I, I hope all children are that kid. No Me one too. wants, yeah, no one wants you to deal with anything terrible. There will be no time to talk about all the uncomfortable subjects where you're yeah. like, yeah, you know, today is the day. I want to talk to my kid about like human trafficking. No, there's never a day that you want to tackle that. But books that bring that up, that put it in a foreign world, that put it in that fantasy world, and then your kid can read that, and then you can have a discussion before you take it to the really emotional world of reality. And that's what I think, I mean, when you get those subjects in the children's books, like why that's so important, because then that, that discussion can happen. Can yeah. I just, I just want to no, no. add, um, when you're talking about, you know, broaching controversial or challenging subjects, how important your books have been, I think, to other fantasy writers as well, certainly to myself, that, um, well, Alana was the first book I ever encountered where a girl, like, got her period. That, and was, that was huge for me. I know. I always, I've been reading books forever going, what are the women doing? You're riding on horses for months. What are the women I, I, doing? And, and I was, no one I ever was, answered it. I was, I didn't read it till my 20s for some yeah. reason. I, I was just behind the times, um, but I started working at a children's bookstore and they were like, oh, have you read these? And I was like, well, no. It was, um, it was Children's Book World in Haverford. I worked there uh, for a few years in the early 2000s. Um, but it was, it was, I was like, wow. You know, even as in my 20s, I was like, wow, okay, you know what? <laughs> this is good <laughs> and this is important. And so, you know, it, it actually is, was a bit inspirational to me in Tesla the Road. Like, she's walking down the road. I'm like, okay, you run away from home without your medieval tampons, whatever those are. <laughs> and what are you going to do, lady? You know, and so I, had, I was like, I can talk about this. Tamara Pierce talked about this. Well, <laughs> I can do it. So, um, you know, it, it, I think, um, gave me courage. I'm sure it has given other writer's courage as well, just to say, you know, we, you can say what needs to be said. She did it, and we, we can all do it. And thank you. <laughs> uh, Rachel, the next question is for you. Um, Tess's story had to have been quite difficult to write. For those of you that haven't read it, I'm not going to give anything away, we're basically seeing Tess at rock bottom. It's a very heartbreaking In start. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, everything basically is just awful like there's it's sort of i mean not like in a really depressing kind of way but just like now everyone really geez. wants to read it they're like awful okay cool cool <laughs> no, it's great it's great because it's for me it was so relatable because she's basically there she's in a no-win situation like she's feeling pressure from both her society and from her family to conform to fit this mold that she clearly wants to do. I mean, you and, and most of us went through the stage where you want to hit that and make everyone happy and be easier. And why can't you be the normal one? But you also know somewhere that there's just there's no amount of contorting you can do to yourself to fit in that mold. So there's no win. I mean, you either cut off you know things that are important to you to fit and just live a half life, or everyone's mad at you. Like there's there's no way about that. Um, and I think that most of us in our teens have gone through that phase. Like, so when you were writing it, is it something you intentionally wanted to tackle with Tess, or did it just evolve with her character? Well, um, I like to think about stories a lot and why we tell them and what are, they, what are they for? Why are we bothering to do this? And I mean, there are as many reasons as there are storytellers, but I think when, when you're... A, a book is a huge commitment, and my books are like 
double huge commitments. Um, and so you, in order to keep going, you really have to have, I think, a really strong sense of, I'm doing this for a reason. This is worth doing, even though sometimes it's, it's really hard. Um, and for me, what I think stories are for uh, is to be a, a roadmap in a way, you know, so that the reader who is reading along, not, not to guide you anywhere specific, but to, to, to give you a sense that, that people have passed this way before, you know, that I am not alone in the universe and having suffered these particular things. And even if not these specific things, just the, the feelings of them, the shame or the, the depression or whatever, what have you. Um, and there, you know, I think we can probably, all of us, point to a time in our lives when, yeah, things were, in fact, the worst. And we thought that we had screwed up beyond the point of no return. And sometimes you just, you know, it just seems like there's, there's, no, there's no way out of this. And I have been there <laughs> in my own way. And, to, and I wanted to write a story about a character who is there and who is, is just stubbornly, out of just sheer bloody-mindedness, not going to stop going. And so she just keeps going until she finds her way back. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think if I'd had this book as a teenager, I, I don't think it would have saved me one iota of heartbreak. So don't imagine that you will read this and say, okay, well, I won't make that mistake. Um, <laughs> but I think it would have given me hope at a very dark time in my life that uh, you can come back to yourself. That when you have lost yourself, you can find yourself again, that you can choose the way forward, and you can be the protagonist of your own life. And that's really sort of what it's for. <laughs> and to know you're not alone. Right. And that, I mean, yeah. I think that's the, and that if you fail, it's not, it isn't the end. Like, like right. at one point, she, I think she, she says something much. kind of about like, I'm done. And, he, and what, um, is, it, is it Pasha? What is the dragon character's name? That I oh, Patka. Patka. Um, where he's like, but you're 17. Like, you have so much life. He's right. like, no, I'm already done. And he's like, I'm very confused by this concept. Um, I think, too, that for me, at least, that was one of the things that I loved um, about writing for teens. And, you know, the books that you get at that age can make such an impact. Um, you know, that for a lot of people, too, especially if you're in an area where maybe you haven't found your tribe yet, and to get that book that says, wait, but we're out here. I mean, it's, it's very heartening. Was there any book that you read um, either in your teens or in a rough spot in your life that was like the book that you needed just then, like a book that really impacted your life? Um, yeah, although I was an adult, actually. Uh, it was uh, The Curse of Chalion by Lois McMaster Bujold. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's read that. It's, it's a really good book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a book that I needed, uh, actually, right when I was starting to write Serafina. It... <laughs> Serafina was, was, in its original incarnation, was a very uh, small story. It was about Serafina and her father in their house not getting along. And it was like Ibsen, but with dragons, like super dark family story. So um, my, my uh, editor, though, said to me, listen, you know, it's like you've created this, this giant garden of a world. And you're in this giant garden, and you're tending a begonia. And maybe it is the very best begonia that anyone's ever seen, and begonia fanciers everywhere will appreciate it, but you're ignoring the whole rest of the garden. And so I was like, oh, but how can I tell that inner story and still have it be big? Well, The Curse of Chalion taught me that at the right time. I happened to read it, and, and it was very much a world-spanning story that was an inward journey as well. And so then I realized it could be done. <laughs> if any of you haven't read Bujold, I came to her embarrassingly late. Like, so like, I think like maybe a year ago, I'm like, how did I miss someone who's written a billion books that are brilliant? The, the Young Miles stories yes. had me in stitches. I mean, those books were just, again, I'm, I'm, oh, the upside of coming along an author that you haven't been reading, you know, that has written, I don't even know how many books she's written. That's yeah, a lot. <laughs> you, you then have a huge backlist to catch up on, so I'll be busy for quite a while. Is there any book that hit you particularly? Doesn't it didn't have to be in your youth, but um, I don't know. You could say the Fellowship of the Ring did that for me, simply in opening this whole universe of 
possibility. Um, but mm, yeah, I think that would have to be it. That or um, no, that. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of those questions that your mind immediately goes blank, and in the oh, middle of the yeah. night, you'll wake up, yeah. you call us, and tell us what you what you, yeah. <laughs> you that came are up the with. Three one. Musketeers. I mean, that just the whole idea of great events intermingling with lesser events, and also the fact that Eowyn gave up the sword. Um, at the end of the trilogy, yeah. and that really burned my bacon. Because <laughs> I saw no reason why. I mean, Faramir didn't. He was going for the husband and father and healer track, like she was going for the wife, mother, and healer track. But he didn't give up his sword, so why did she? So, yeah, in a way... That started me rolling. Why are women always giving stuff up to marry? Why are women always giving stuff up to let the guy go first? I didn't. I was already burning because my three favorite girls' books, uh, Mara, da Daughter of the Nile, uh, The Witch of Blackbird Pond, and... Um, Caddy Woodlawn. At the end of the book, all three books, the girls settle down. Well, Kip is sailing, but she spends, you know, half the year in, um, in on land with her mother-in-law. And Caddy, well, we've run with the col colts long enough, Caddy. How about it's time we try the other way? And Mara, of course, is going to get fabulously wealthy and marry an Egyptian noble, but they're all being asked to do the, the things that they weren't doing to get them there. The adventure things, the things where what they did changed events. And that's the whole structure of my career right there. I wonder how many of us have a career based on irritation. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I mean seriously, no, just, just, I mean, not, I mean, just reaction to you read something and you're like, this is irritating. Why is this happening? And so you write a whole book just like, this is what would happen if it didn't happen. It, and it wasn't just a matter of irritation. It was betrayal and loneliness and fury because even in sixth grade, I was damned tired of being told you can't. You can't do this. You can't do that. No, girls don't do that. Boys do that. Boys do that. Boys will be president. Girls won't be president. Girl, boys can be lawyers. Girls are silly lawyers. It went on. It was this never-ending chant in the ear of every girl and woman I knew. And those books just gave me a focus for my rage. <laughs> and I loved them, but they also created the format that my life would follow. Yeah. As someone who um, would often be sent from the dinner table for unladylike behavior, oh, man. for mimicking what my brothers were doing, oh, yeah, no, that was the rage. I hate that. I hate that. I heard that I'm, you're being unlady. The number of people older than me I wanted to punch. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Light just didn't seem very appealing. They kept, they kept saying, that's very unladylike. Well, that, that, I don't want that goal then. That sounds terrible. It, you're, you want to be ladylike. It means you can't do stuff. No, I want to do stuff. I can do stuff. That's not ladylike. You can't raise your voice. It's not ladylike. You can't say no. That's not ladylike. It went on and on, and it still goes on. What is the anti-Me Too wash? But girls, you're not being ladylike. 
Ladies keep their miseries and their heartbreak and their wounds and their trauma to themselves. They don't ruin people's careers. It's very naughty. This man is prosperous. He's got a wife and family. You should think about him. <laughs> no, I think not. Yeah, I'm still mad. <laughs> You're mad, but I'm having so much fun. Um, is there anything you guys have read recently that you'd love to talk about? Any book that you've read that just really you would love to maybe gush over? Or Well, I read this really cool book by... <laughs> I really liked it. And Philip Pullman has a new one out. Finally! Oh. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Uh, and Libba Bray's new one. I've also discovered a, what I think of as a new area of fantasy. Cowboy fantasy. <laughs> There's about six books out there now. It's Magic in the Wild West. I, I, I am loving this cowboy fantasy. <laughs> Lila Bull Bowen, I think, is one of the writers. But, but there's a, at least six that I've found that it's, it's exciting and it's different and it's fun. As someone who's writing one of those? Yes! <laughs> well, let's not say well. We'll see how it turns out, but I'm, I'm giving it a go. You need a blur. Know where to find me. There'll be a shelf for you. <laughs> um, how about you? What have you been reading? Um, the Bells by Danielle Clayton, and um, a book by my, my fellow Canadian, S.K. Ali, called Saints and Misfits, which is about um, some lively and intelligent and adorable hijabi girls. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, have you seen that one? That, it's, it's, it's really fun. It's fun reading. Um, and actually right now, I'm, I'm reading a book for research. I don't know what I think I'm researching, um, but it's called Behave, the Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst by Robert Sapolsky, and I love it so hard. And I, <laughs> um, It's super technical about your brain at first, but I'm, I'm, I heard him talk on the radio in, in Canada. Uh, we have a radio show called Quirks and Quirks where they interview scientists and um, he was talking about the effect of metaphor on the human brain, and I knew, I, mean, I was like, that's the book I need, right there, right there. So that's the book I'm reading, and it's really cool. So uh, that's nonfiction, I hope, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were doing the wavy sign to me, which means I should probably get to some of your guys' questions. So we're gonna play that fun game where I try to read your handwriting. Um, uh, how do you feel about your novels becoming feminist icons for young readers? This basically applies to both of you. So I don't know which one you want to field it. How do we feel? Well, that was our evil plan all along. <laughs> I'd say we feel pretty good. How about you? <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't have to be feminist icons. They can just be human icons as long as it's acknowledged that the humans are girls and getting to do stuff. <laughs> Guys, you can help. <laughs> Grown-ups can help too. Yeah. But first, last, foremost, and always. <laughs> girls <laughs> rock. <laughs> hey, I'm writing guys all the time. I can say what I want. Um, if you could go back and change one thing from any of your books, what would it be? I wouldn't. I can see them all over the place. The books are lousy with them. The worst thing about being a writer is that you're your own worst critic. And if you look at something you did a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, or worse, when it was published in, eight, in 1983, you can see all kinds of things you would do differently now. But unless it's something that you want to work on some more, 
There's a story about the painter who wanted a perfect painting. So he kept going back to the same painting over and over. And when he died, he did indeed have one perfect painting to show for a lifetime of work. I would rather do my best and keep trying to improve by writing more books. And you are always going to be your worst critic. So you've got to decide at what point you stop fixing it up and send it out and get to work on the next thing if you don't want to be that guy with just the one work. I will say, as, a, as another author, I actually just went back and like reread all the books. Not all the books, but all of your books, anyway. Uh, which is a lot at this point, and um, <laughs> which is great. This is, you know, squad goals. That's where I want to be. Um, but having read them so long and Jane put... Jane Yolen has 130. <sighs> Now you can live with my pain. <laughs> <laughs> but what, I mean, at this point, you know, I've been reading them so long um, that, you know, it's hard not to put some of your favorite writers kind of up on a pedestal. And then, but going back and rereading from the beginning and seeing you grow and change as a writer was tremendously heartening because it was like, well, okay, like I can see her getting better with each one. And this is not saying that the first ones weren't awesome. I love them to bits, but as you should be, you're growing with each yeah. book. And so I'm like, okay, well then maybe eventually mine will get better. Just edge it. So it was, no, it was, it was, it was very, as, a, yeah, as another writer, it made me feel a lot better. That's the process. You do keep getting better, which is, which is why you should keep going, because backing up just keeps you working on the same project. Well, and I think, just, just on that same question, you know, I think that at least in my experience, you, you change as a person too yeah. over the course of writing a book, you know? And that the person you are by the end of this book, you're not the same person at the beginning. So what would you do differently? Well, you do everything differently because this book is now irrelevant, right? You, you grew out of it, you're done, and it, you're, it's boring, and you're, you'd write the next book that you're going to write. So that's what I would do differently is write the next book. Wait, uh, <laughs> there's a temporal paradox there somewhere, but I'll, I'll figure that out later. I think that's why it's, it's, I've, I've seen a lot of you know, um, authors get asked the question, you know, what, what's your, what was your favorite book to work on? They're always like, the one I'm not working on yet. <laughs> Where it's, a, it's it, when it's still the, the shiny, beautiful right. idea that you haven't had to try to like trap in a book and then ruin, because you just, you right. can't, nothing will be as good as it is in your head, no matter how hard you try. And so like all of us love that, because this is also, it's not complicated. Like you haven't started really working on it yet, you haven't realized you hate everything, <laughs> which is, the stage I always get at with writing, where just I just want to burn it and maybe go raise goats. But um, all right, let's get back on track. Um, goats can be smarter than we are, you know. No, goats are like goats are. I'm like looking at it as a challenge. I'll raise the goats. Okay. Um, will this ser series cover any of Numair's time in Tortal, or will it end when he leaves Karthak? That one keeps coming up. Um, no, it, it will not. Well, I, that, I, that gives away the ending. <laughs> you will find out, Sam. There are two more books to go, okay? Assume I get him some. You, you cheer now. <laughs> Keep that in mind, will you? Um, how are the cats you and your spouse creature take care of? Well, Dewey and Scooter are getting kind of old. And Dewey's losing weight, and we've got him on fluids. Um, we acquired two new rescues. One is named Peekaboo, and we are keeping him. He is very soft and orange and white and adorable. He runs away from Tim, which <laughs> hurts Tim deeply. And then... There, we have had some black cats living in and around the garage in the basement, and we lost two of them. But I was able to catch one who'd been living out there for about two years and had suddenly decided that he would sniff my fingers, and then he would let me pet his head, and then he started living in the habitat. And after he went missing for two days, um, I checked the habitat and he peeped at me and I grabbed him. But before I grabbed him, 
I named him something, and then the next day, he wasn't there, and I went and I asked my assistant, Julie, you remember I told you and Tim what I named the third black cat in the garage, and now I can't remember if I named what I named him. So I named him something. What was it? She looked at me dead-faced and said something. <laughs> so something is getting ready for the big snip, as is Peekaboo. <laughs> and he's got a white sprinkling of fur across his, the back of his neck and his shoulders. And he's very lively and affectionate. And Tim and Julie insist we are going to find a home for him, because that will leave us with nine cats in the house, and seven or eight in the yard and the cellar, and that's the ones we're sure of. <laughs> so they're doing pretty well. They're, uh, Raja and uh, Doppelganger, who I thought would have a very bad winter, have done well this far, and everybody else is their same old selves. You're all updated now. <laughs> I also am really intrigued by a cat named Something. That makes me. So I worked. I worked at a vet clinic for several years, and any of the animals with weird names were great. If it was named Killer or you know Deathbringer, they would be really cuddly. But if you had one coming in named Baby, <laughs> Sweetie would eat your face. Like anything named the really cutesy names were the really mean animals, which I found really something. You would you wouldn't know what's coming at you if something came in. Um, my, my first adult cat, the one that inspired his character, um, was a black cat named Fido. <laughs> Fido had issues. <laughs> and he became faithful. Um, would you guys be open to making your books into a TV series or a movie if it was optioned? Um... <laughs> I'm, maybe, I don't know, I'm not sure. It, it hasn't come up and I try not to think about it too much. I think it would be weird. I mean, I, I, would have to, I think I would have to think of it as very elaborate, expensive fan fiction. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, and that, that I'd, I'd be like, oh, that's someone's, someone's impression of, of my characters and what I did, and okay, you know, I, I don't think I would be upset by it unless they really blew it and then I would just have to I wonder if it would be like bed. listening. If you, do you, your books are on audio, right? Can you, books are on audio. Can yeah. you listen to them? I can't listen to mine. It's too weird because they don't well, sound like they uh, sound in my head. Actually, so. my I I really like the voice of the woman that did Seraphine and Shadow Scale. It's a different woman for Tess, and I haven't listened to her yet. Um, the only thing is, in in Seraphine and Shadow Scale, there are these songs. I am incorrigible, and I can't stop writing song lyrics. Uh, and and you know, you make up a song and you don't really have a tune for it, but, but you sort of do, right? You have a sort of an impression of what, I'm, I sing in a madrigal choir, so maybe I have more of an impression than, than I should. But it, she, she sang the songs, like she made up her own tune just kind of on the spot, this sort of little tuneless tune, and I, that, for whatever reason, I was like, no, that's the wrong tune, that's, that's not the tune. That's a, and like, how is she supposed to know, right? I mean, it just, you know, and they don't even really have to, so I'm... Yeah, we don't, we don't get freak. phone calls, by the way. They don't call us to ask how to pronounce our characters usually or how do the songs sound or anything like that. We just... Well, I, wouldn't have, I didn't have a real tune to tell. Like, what was I going to do, right? <laughs> Compose one. Hang on. Me, me. You know. Give me five minutes. <laughs> Would you like to see Alana or anyone else on the big screen? Um, well, I'd have to do the James M. Cain trick when asked if he liked what the movie people did with his books, he pointed to the shelf with his books on them, said, there are my books. Nobody's done anything to them. Um, I call to your attention Heo Miyazaki's presentation of... Um, Howl's Moving Castle? Howl's Moving Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Diana Wynne-Jones loved it. Um, it had very little to do with Diana Wynne-Jones's Howl's Moving Castle. And then there's always um, Aragon. <laughs> Two opposites, you see. Um, 
that's, that's the movie business. They tell you, your books are great, they're wonderful, they're popular, we'll fix them. <laughs> and in my case, I have 18 or so books in one universe with characters that mix across the series. And, and I forget how many in the other with the same thing. And movie people don't like that. <laughs> they like you to have one neat, tidy little series where everybody stays put. And I've, so I've had a little difficulty with movie people. <laughs> and, and I have not always been a, a professional, um, well-behaved person. <laughs> in, I, fa in fact, I made my agent's voice crack. <laughs> and he had known me for years and surely knew the worst of which I was capable, but apparently not. <laughs> and that put a stop to movie offers for about 10 or 15 years. I actually, I did, I did try to watch the Aragon movie. If you I'm love sorry. it, if you love it, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, had, I had read the book and my husband hadn't because he doesn't, he only reads books with zombies in them. So clearly we're outside of his wheelhouse. I was like, well did, okay, did that make sense to you? Cause like I, and he goes, no, I have no idea what just happened. And we both hated it so much. I actually went out and put, it was ne like Netflix. I put it in the mailbox right away. It was like, keep in mind, it's two in the morning. I was living in post-apocalyptic New Orleans, like we were under martial law. It was legitimately dangerous to leave my house at dark. It had to leave my house. <laughs> this can be here no longer. Couldn't you have gotten a voodoo woman to do something with, to just take the curse off? You know, I lacked connections at that time. Maybe ah. now. Maybe now. Okay, because next time that happens, get your house cleansed. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to fit in at least, I think we can at least do one more of these before, because we have books to sign and things. Um, are you still planning to write a new book about Tris? 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 I've read them, but I can never pronounce oh anyone's names. Look, guys. <laughs> no, no, this isn't a funny one. As far as I know, Scholastic is planning to dump me. Thank you. <laughs> but seriously, I guess they feel I haven't worked out for them. It may change with the numbers from these books. I don't know. But as things stand now, it's possible Random House may pick up the Circle books and then Triss's book will get done. I hope so, because I have stuff planned for that girl. <laughs> but that's the state now. So if any of you feel like writing a publisher, say, and making a lot of noise, that might be a good... They don't listen to us when we complain. They're like, they're like the last person they're going to listen to. Um, all right, well, I would like to thank you guys for answering my questions and having a lovely chat, and I'm sure that some people would like books signed. Yes? Yeah, that's a thing you guys want, right? That's a thing.